Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Sarah Fenske. You know, they got bad information. One of the people running for the governor of the state of Missouri is an honorary member of the Ku Klux Klan. There's a sentence I thought would never come out of my mouth. But it can't be admissible to just say, well, you're not guilty because you went out and got yourself. It drunk. terrifies me to see SWAT raids being used in this manner. Morons and insane people have just as much right to run for elected office as everybody else. Well, the law can be complicated, and joining us today to make sense of it is a panel of three top lawyers. Eric Banks is a former city councilor for the city of St. Louis. He's also an attorney and mediator at Banks Law. Eric, welcome back. Thank you. And we're also joined today by Dave Rowland. He is Director of Litigation at the Freedom Center of Missouri. Dave, welcome back. Thank you, Sarah. And last but never least, today we're joined by Nicole Gorofsky. She's a former prosecutor in both state and federal court, and she practices at Jenkins and Kling PC Attorneys at Law. Nicole, welcome back. Thanks for having me. So before we get to that SWAT raid, before we talk about racial discrimination at a historically black university, we need to talk about a lawsuit brought by the state of Missouri that went before the U.S. Supreme Court this past month. Now, we have discussed the case that the attorney general's office uh, filed many times on this show. It's now called Murthy versus Missouri. It's focused on the federal government's interaction with social media companies during COVID-19. Both Missouri and Louisiana filed suit against the federal government. They said federal agencies had wrongly pressured social media companies to censor conservative views and President Joe Biden's critics. So, Nicole, tell us, what did, what did we learn during these oral arguments? Well, so there are two states bringing this type of lawsuit. There's Missouri and there's Louisiana, of course, both red states. And the lawsuits are an attempt to limit the Biden administration or administrations in general if it becomes permanent um, and their interactions with social media companies. So during oral arguments, the justices seemed very skeptical of the attempt. Um, most justices seemed convinced that the government officials can attempt to persuade social media companies to do things, but not coerce them to do things. So that's the issue here. And then also, uh, Jim Jordan was just on 60 Minutes this past weekend talking about the same issue. And interesting, he used what I call a little bit of verbal judo uh, and flipped the issue and saying that this is a First Amendment issue uh, against the social media. So the social media company should have a First Amendment right to not have this interference. The problem is what what these lawsuits and Mr. Jordan attempt to do is curtail government employee First Amendment issues and their right to speak to these social media companies and ask them and try to persuade them without uh, any kind of retaliation or coercive measures. Okay, so we hear this phrase coercion. Dave, this came up a fair amount during these uh, the questioning from these justices. Yeah, it, it did. And so what we mean by coercion, it means an implied threat if you don't do what the government wants you to do. So there is a distinction between a government official contacting a media company and saying, hey, you know, we're really unhappy that you did this. Uh, we think that in the future, maybe you shouldn't publish something like this. Um, that is simply expressing the government's feelings it doesn't necessarily carry with it an implied threat of additional regulation or some other kind of governmental in interference if the media company does not comply with the government's wishes. And, and so what was happening in Murphy versus Missouri is basically Louisiana and Missouri staked out a position saying that it was improper for the government just to express its opinion about the speakers and the ideas being hosted on these platforms, even if there was no implied threat. And so the pushback that I saw from the justices was that, look, it is the most normal thing in the world 
for a government official to contact the media when they feel like they've got something wrong and express their opinions about it. Sure. As long as you do not follow up that um, that opinion with an implied threat, then it, it, how in the world are we going to say that this is actually a First Amendment problem? Yeah. Um, and, and so um, this distinction was really highlighted by the, the case that the court heard immediately after it dealt with um, some actions New York had taken in regard to the National Rifle Association. And in that case, the coercion was front and center. In the Murphy versus Missouri case, um, the government was a little bit more hard pressed, like the state government was a little bit more hard pressed to show exactly how the government had uh, engaged in improper coercion. And so I think that there's a decent chance that Missouri loses this lawsuit. Yeah, I agree, especially because what they're seeking is a really broad injunction, um, asking basically to curtail the speech across the board. And the Supreme Court justices were just not uh, being persuaded by that. I, I wanted to follow that up. It, it was actually one of the funny moments in the courtroom. Uh, you had one of the more stereotypically conservative justices, Kavanaugh, and then one of the more stereotypically liberal justices, Kagan, both of whom had previously worked for the executive branch. And they were kind of like, wait a minute, we used to do this all the time. This, yeah. is, this is kind of par for the course. Uh, and, and so people kind of laughed about that. And then Chief Justice Roberts chimed in and said, let me go on the record and say that I've never tried to <laughs> call and, and persuade media companies about their content. And everybody got a good laugh out of it. But that really kind of highlighted th the breadth of the argument that the states were making and, and why I feel like they're not going to get a lot of purchase among the justices. Yeah, I mean, Eric, this was kind of Eric Schmidt's baby, our former attorney general who's now a U.S. Senator, it sounds like Missouri just went a little bit too far with this thing. It staked out a claim they, they couldn't really even back up. Well, as much as I like being the odd person out and going left when everybody else goes right, I agree with the other two panelists on this one. Yeah. Um, should they have even brought this case in the first place? You know, my so my first question when they brought the case was whether they could demonstrate coercion. And there are a number of somewhat concerning messages that they came up with where you had administration officials cussing out uh, the social media companies, perhaps implying that if they didn't get in line, then additional regulation might be applied to the companies. But I don't think that it was as clear that those threats led to any particular individual, especially one of the plaintiffs, mm -hmm. being harmed. And that that's a standing issue. Yeah. Um, so can, can even, you even bring this if, exactly. if you haven't been harmed? So, so there may well have been some evidence to support the theory, but they didn't have the plaintiffs that might be necessary to actually follow through on that particular theory. Could they point to anyone who had suffered from coercion who had been harmed? Well, potentially the social media companies themselves could have, but they're not plaintiffs. Right. And, and so the, the state governments can't press claims on behalf of these companies that have not themselves said that they were injured here. Okay. Nicole? Yeah, this was one of those cases that I used to call them Eric Schmidt specials. The, the kind of case that gets filed that gets more... Um, publicity and things like that for the filing of the case, but isn't uh, very likely to win anything, especially for the state of Missouri. But here's the part that kind of stops me is I remember discussing this, I think, with you, uh, you know, more than a year ago. And we talked about how this was an Eric Schmidt special. And yet the Fifth Circuit saw something here. Is our takeaway that these uh, circuit courts, uh, the circuit appellate courts, have become so politicized that they're going to see something there where there is nothing? Or do you have a more charitable explanation for how they could have issued an injunction based on what now looks like a dog of a case? So I, I want to clarify. I do think that there was some concerning evidence that was turned up. I think the real problem that's been identified by the justices was, number one, the breadth of the state's theory, and then number two, you don't have a plaintiff who was directly impacted by the most concerning evidence that was turned up. So I don't think we're likely to get an opinion that just says there's not actually anything to see here. I think more likely we're going to get an opinion that says whether or not there was anything to see here, you don't have the correct plaintiff. Somebody else has got to bring this case. So I, I'm not I'm not going to poo-poo the theory itself of the case. I actually, it turned up more evidence than I thought was likely to exist. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, they, they didn't have the right plaintiffs, I think, to bring a successful outcome here. Eric? Memory is the second thing to go, and I can't remember what the first thing is. But isn't this the case that was brought in Texas in the jurisdiction where there was only one federal judge? And then it was kicked up to the Fifth Circuit, which is one of the most 
conservative circuits in the United States? There are plenty of those, but but this was actually a different one. This was brought in Louisiana District Court, um, and I don't believe it was a single judge district either in this one. Uh, the 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 abortion pill case that was heard yesterday that's right, was uh, from that single district in Texas. So that's maybe how some of these end up escalating. You get it in front of the right judge. That's that right. can make a huge difference. If you have a question or comment about what we're talking about here today with our legal roundtable, you can call us at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK. You can also uh, send us a tweet at STL on air. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we'll talk about claims of discrimination against Harris Stowe and the jury trial that happened here in St. Louis in this past month. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome back. So, Eric, Harris Stowe State University, they lost a jury trial in St. Louis last week. It came in a lawsuit filed by Beverly Buck Brennan. She is the daughter of Jack Buck, also Joe Buck's sister, so part of this uh, prominent St. Louis family. She was a longtime theater professor at Harris Stowe State University. She retired in 2017. She later sued the university, alleging racial and sex discrimination as well as retaliation. She alleges they cut her budget, reduced her teaching load subjected her to unfair treatment. Uh, What do we know about this case that she was able to bring against them? In terms of full disclosure, perhaps it would be better if I stayed away from the merits of the case. Nick Lamb was my former law partner when I was at Thompson Cobram. On the other hand, I think the world of the plaintiff's counsel, Jeremy Hollingshead, who actually beat me the last time I tried a case against him last year. Now, I know the player haters in your audience are saying, boy, every time he comes on this program, he's talking about some kind of case he lost. (laughs) He sure loses a lot of cases. Yeah, but I try a lot of cases, too. That's right. You stay very busy. Yeah, Yeah. so that goes with the territory. But um, I think the case should be settled. Surprise, surprise. Because the real issue is not going to be the $750,000 jury verdict which I don't think the judge will let them keep all of that. I think Mm -hmm. the judge will reduce it on remediator. But the key is, what will the attorney's fees be? And that case that Jeremy beat me with, he asked for $194,000 at trial. The jury came back with $8,000. So because I count funny, that was a win in my book. Technically, it was a loss, but it was a win. Jeremy then did a fee application because of the fee shifting provision and asked for over $500,000. The judge came back with the ruling of $120,000, which once again, I count as a win. Yeah. But that is still a disproportionately large fee, in my opinion, given what the jury came back with. (laughs) So what the jury comes back with and what's left to remain after a miniature is one thing, but you always have to factor in those attorney's fees, which is why this and every other case needs to be settled. This could be settled. Okay, so we're talking jury comes back with a $750,000 award, and you're saying if this ended up being fulfilled in total, we could be looking at a lot of attorney's fees on top of that. Jeremy Hollingshead, the attorney who won this case, you saw a big bill that his firm brought in. Um, So you would advise Harris Stowe to settle this one. I guess I'm kind of curious about the merits of this case. And we actually have a caller who does have a question about that. This is Matthew in Baldwin. Matthew, hi, you're on St. Louis on the Air. Hi there. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the situations of the case, but if the professor won a discrimination lawsuit, uh, it seems to me very redundant or... 
Okay, and Matthew, I'm sorry to say that was kind of a bad connection there. Uh, maybe you were driving. I know sometimes these things can shift, and I'm sorry about that. I think I think the question Matthew is coming in at is he was somewhat surprised by my question: Should white employees at a black college be treated the same as black employees? Dave, what are your thoughts on that question? So it's actually a little more complicated than than some people might um, assume. One of the things that's happened in the last couple of years, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ended up holding that even private universities, which normally would not be bound by the Constitution, um, have to respect equal protection of the laws if they accept federal funding. And uh, a lot of these HBCUs do accept federal funding. But the one point that I want to make is... Um, the the anti-discrimination element here where you're arguing that you can't discriminate against white people goes only so far as of right now. So courts have been, I think, firm on the idea that you can have discrimination, you can have affirmative action policies to the extent that they are aimed at uh, remedying past discrimination, segregation, or slavery. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that HBCUs are set up and that their missions are tied to trying to remedy the vestiges of slavery or past discrimination, to that extent, I think, yes, they can treat um, white employees differently than uh, African-American employees. Um, It's it's when we get away from the, the efforts to remediate slavery or past discrimination, that it becomes a lot touchier of a question. So in your theory of this, with a historically black college or university like Harris-Stowe, would you argue they could give some preferences in hiring? They're they're saying, we're here to help black students succeed. They need black professors to be role models. That's an argument that yeah, I would un- feel under comfortable Under limited making. circumstances, I think that that's correct. Where, where Harvard and the University of North Carolina went wrong with their policies is they didn't even try to just Justify them as uh, trying to combat the vestiges of slavery or discrimination. They said that their purpose was just to ensure diversity in the student body. And, and the court said, well, that's not sufficient. That's not an adequate justification for engaging in preferential treatment of, of one group over another. Okay. And Harris Stowe, just by their very charter, they're there to try to combat uh, discrimination. I think that's a pretty strong argument. I'm not going to guarantee that Harris Stowe would win that kind of an argument, but but I think it's a, a, a strong argument to make. And so there I was sort of in my hypothetical talking about hiring. This is somewhat of a di- different question in that Beverly Buck Brennan, this white woman, had already been hired. She said she was then subject to treatment that, you know, she described things being thrown at her or that she wasn't sort of given a fair shake in how she was treated. Nicole, does that open the university up for just to this to just this sort of claim that we saw brought yeah. here? I mean, this concept of being subject to um, federal law and constitutional principles if you accept uh, federal funding is not a small deal. I mean, there's pretty much not, I, I'm not sure I can think of a university in the country that doesn't accept some sort of federal funding in the uh, sense of financial aid and things like that. I think there's only like one or two, you know, Hillsdale uh, mm-hmm. in Michigan very famously Grove refuses City College to is accept one. it. Right. Yeah, but so, everybody else. So I think, you know, I think it is an issue. And I think, you know, one of the things that is really interesting is the way that we used to think about these types of lawsuits. I mean, we used to call them reverse discrimination lawsuits, and they've been around for a really long time. And I think, um, you know, when you first saw reverse discrimination lawsuits, I mean, I think I saw some even in the 90s. We used to kind of laugh at them and say they have no jury appeal and they're not going to get anywhere. And, you know, regardless of what the law is, is a jury ever going to find reverse discrimination? I think it's um, maybe an interesting thing to think about that the political tides are changing in our country and these cases are maybe coming out a little differently. And I think it's also interesting to uh, look at what I something that I didn't know was that there have also been 12 previous similar lawsuits, I think, against, against Harris Stowe. Stowe. Yeah. Yes. And so certainly that it used to be attorneys probably wouldn't even bring these cases because of the lack of jury appeal. 
obviously now there's a barrage of more cases. And I think it's just a fascinating thing to think about in terms of what our political culture is. I think that you raise an excellent question there. And this, it's worth noting, this went before a city of St. Louis jury. Eric, you're very familiar with our county juries, our city juries. Are you surprised that a city jury, where I imagine the racial composition is such, this was not an all-white jury. There's no way. That's not what happens on city juries. That they would be in favor of this claim. I am not surprised. The facts that I read about on CaseNet and in the Post-Dispatch seem quite egregious. Mm. And if the um, plaintiff's counsel was able to get nine out of 12 jurors in the city of St. Louis to agree with them, well, I can see how it could happen. Now, keep in mind that this is the city, um, the state court, where you only need nine out of 12. In federal court, you have to have a unanimous decision, six out of six. Okay. So that's interesting. Yeah, you don't need all the jurors to be in favor of this. I haven't seen a breakdown on this one of how many jurors were were on each side of this. Something else I thought was interesting about this case, Beverly Buck Brennan, she wasn't fired. Uh, She wasn't even demoted. And I think sometimes employers think, okay, I, I can't be sued. This person happily retires. That's obviously not the case here. Well, she did think she was going to get tenure. And I think um, certainly at universities, tenure is a big issue. And people who come up for tenure, my father was a university professor, so I know a little bit of inside baseball about this. People who are coming up for tenure and don't get it, that Mm -hmm. can be an adverse employment action. Yeah, that makes sense. Dave, anything you'd want to add on this one? I, th- I think we've covered the waterfront there. I think that, um, you know, one one thing that I would add is the way that the jury ruled, I think, was focused more on employment discrimination rather than constitutional issues. And and that does change the framing of, of the case just a little bit. And uh, I think that that may be why um, why the jury was able to come down this way, looking at it as, you know, Let's just focus on whether there was an adverse employment action here. And, and it certainly sounds like from, from the facts that there probably was. So sort of that classic hostile work environment. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Here's another case that has made some headlines in the past couple of weeks. One of the people running for the governor of the state of Missouri is an honorary member of the Ku Klux Klan. There's a sentence I thought would never come out of my mouth. What Missouri, what is wrong with y'all? Uh, so this man, Daryl McClanahan, he's running as a Republican. But when newspapers connected McClanahan to hate groups, photos of him surfaced uh, at a cross-burning ceremony. He had some different name for this ceremony. He insists he's just honorary. He's not the actual KKK. Seems bad enough. The Republican Party filed suit to force him off the ballot. So in their argument, the Republican Party deploys the First and the Fourteenth Amendments. Dave, do you think they have a case where they can boot this honorary KKK member off from running as a Republican? I'm pretty confident the Republican Party is going to lose here. Wow. Um, so two, two years ago, there was a similar situation. Uh, where a big Trump supporter who had previously run for office as a Republican declared his candidacy in a Democratic primary. And uh, the Democratic Party belatedly realized, you know, his um, prior affiliations. And they said, we don't want anything to do with this guy. And they tried to return his filing fee. Um, and the court and, and I was I was representing the candidate in that case. And, and the court said, look, um, you accepted the filing fee. And there's there's no backseas here, you know, by by accepting the filing fee, you voluntarily chose to associate with this candidate. And now that you have buyer's remorse doesn't mean that you get to have him removed from the ballot. Um, And I think that's exactly what's going to happen here. Um, Clearly, political parties do have a right to determine who they're going to associate with. Um, If a party wanted to refuse a filing fee that was being offered on behalf of a candidate, they've got a very strong argument. They've got a right to do that under the Constitution. But once they have accepted the filing fee, they've effectively waived their right to disassociate themselves with this candidate. At that point, it's up to the voters to decide if this is going to be the party's candidate going forward. Boy, well, uh, I wonder if the voters of Missouri, uh, (laughs) 
they have lots of other choices on this ballot. One would hope that this would not be the road that the voters of Missouri want to go down. I think there's an interesting contrast here. Uh, you have a Democrat, uh, State Representative Sarah Unsicker, who came under some fire because of her associations with some known anti-Semites and some anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. She advanced about two different candidates who were running for attorney general. She went in to put in her filing fee, and the Democratic Party said, hey, we're actually not going to accept your Democrat your filing fee to run as a Democrat. You can run for this office. You can't do it as a Democrat. Dave, you think they got some good legal advice on that one? I, I think they did. Um, that's that's the correct way to go at this. Um, one other thing that I want to add is is the Republican Party has asked Jay Ashcroft as Secretary of State to remove this candidate from the ballot, and uh, he's not allowed. Uh, we won another case in 2014 called Vowell versus Cander, where uh, former Secretary of State Cander did unilaterally remove a candidate from the ballot, um, and the courts ultimately said, no, you have to put her back on the ballot because uh, the Secretary of State does not have this authority. It's got to go through the courts, and it's got to be brought by an, an opponent if you wanted to challenge a candidate's qualifications. Yeah, and it, you know, in fairness to Jay Ashcroft, he himself is running in the same race. So it, it would be very awkward if he removed somebody, you know, started vetting which of his opponents were allowed to be on, on the ballot. I am most interested to see how the attorney general's office handles this case. Uh, they presented precisely the correct uh, responses in the case a couple of years ago when the Democratic Party was on the other side. Now that you've got the attorney general's and the secretary of state's own party asking for this person to be removed, I'm interested to see if the approach of the attorney general's office changes. Yeah, well, it they shouldn't. stick with principle is sort of the question that, here. That is the question. But then we're in the position where the attorney general of the state of Missouri is arguing on behalf of an honorary member of the KKK. I don't like the look of that. Well, I think that morons and insane people have just as much right to run for elected office as everybody else. So... And on that note, can I can I go back to this uh, cross burning ceremony? That's not a cross burning ceremony. Uh, yes, I would love just for you to go there. Just because it makes me laugh, he was photographed attending what he called a Christian identity cross lighting ceremony, an event that, while it featured a burning cross, he insists was definitely not a cross burning. As a Jewish person, I'm going to say there ain't no difference. <laughs> Yeah, you know, as, as the editor of the story that you're quoting from, I will say, as my writer was working on that, we were like, wow, this is a first that somebody is making this argument. I wonder how this will fly. It was good to see a lot of derision uh, directed towards that argument and a lot of people saying, this guy got to get out of town. That is a cross-burning ceremony. We may find out if the voters feel the same way. Uh, if Dave's theory of the law ends up being accurate, this guy could be allowed to stay on the ballot. I guess the moral of the story is, Parties maybe need to do a little vetting before they take that filing fee. We're going to take a quick break. Coming up next, we're going to talk about a SWAT raid over a false identification from the Find My app. Uh, this is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. I am Sarah Fenske in today with our legal roundtable. So last May, a SWAT team raided a home in Ferguson. There were little kids inside that included a three-month-old baby. They bashed through the front door with a battering ram. To me, this is pretty terrifying stuff. And now it appears that the only reason this house was targeted was a pair of stolen AirPods. These AirPods had been in a car that was carjacked. Their owner, working with law enforcement, cooperating to try to find out who'd carjacked him, used his Find My app, and so law enforcement traced them to this home in Ferguson. Well, we now know the carjackers just tossed the AirPods on the street as they blazed by. The AirPods were never in the house. This family had nothing to do with the carjacking. This was a false positive from an imprecise technology. Nicole, the SWAT team came in 
saying they had probable cause for this raid. Did they have probable cause for this raid? And who has to sign off on them coming in with a battering ram bursting through your front door? Right. So that's what I want people to understand about probable cause. First, it's a legal concept. So probable cause basically just means that it's more likely than not that this thing happened that you're saying happened. And uh, the way that search warrants work are usually the uh, police officer will write the search warrant, maybe in conjunction with a prosecutor uh, in the writing, but for sure a prosecutor will have to sign off on it saying, yes, I agree there's probable cause here. And then it goes to the judge. And then the judge makes the final determination about whether or not there's probable cause. So what I find interesting in this case is that if it was, I'd love to read the search warrant, by the way, if it was fully based just on this find my uh, iPhone app, then I think maybe we have some questions about, you know, the legal concept and and the prosecutor and the judge and and what they found. I want to know if there was 100% truthful information in the probable cause statement, uh, sorry, in the search warrant to lead to the determination of probable cause, because did they say more than that? Did they say Um, that they had some knowledge that this Find My iPhone app was more accurate than it actually was. Did they say that it meant that the uh, iPods at issue were actually in the house? I'm so curious at what this search warrant actually says, especially because the uh, iPods, as you said, were eventually just found in, they had been tossed out the car and left in the street outside. We we should say AirPods. These were the little headphones. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) sorry. My teenagers are laughing at me out there somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they were tossed out of a car window and left in the street. They weren't even in this family's house. And so, you know, I like I said, I'm dying to read that search warrant to see what's in there. From the facts that we know at this point, we can't say whether, you know, who is at fault? Is it the police officer, the prosecutor, the judge? We don't know. Eric, if you had been the prosecutor on this case or the judge on this case and law enforcement comes to you and says, hey, I've got this identification based on this find my, you know, the AirPods must be in this house. Would you have signed off on that? Oh, I can guarantee you that the application was written in such a way that the prosecutor would sign off on it. And the prosecutor's application was written in such a way that the judge would sign up on it. So I am not convinced that it would be very insightful to read what the paperwork said, because the paperwork is, quite frankly, the functional equivalent to a police report. And police reports are always written in a a manner that justifies the police action. And I'm pro-police, but I, I understand that. Yeah. So you think maybe there's some embroidery that would have said, oh, yes, and, and, you know, this is a known house of of ill repute or something. A certain amount of poetic license. Poetic license. That's a good term for it. Dave, say that there was outright lies in what was in this search warrant that allowed this raid to go through. Could this family then come back and say, hey, we are going to, you know, they're trying to sue here. Could they have a good case to sue here? If it could be proven that there were knowing misstatements a fact. Yes. Um, Part of the problem that we've got, though, is as long as the police have some level of plausible deniability saying, oh, well, we actually did believe this, um, that makes it incredibly difficult for plaintiffs to recover or even to bring a lawsuit against law enforcement. So this sort of embroidery Eric's talking about, that would be hard It it could be difficult to prove that they actually had knowledge that it was incorrect. Um, And, you know, we're we're able to kind of laugh about this particular situation because it's it's so ridiculous. And at least in this situation, nobody got harmed. But the thing that I want to make sure people are keeping in mind is this is not a harmless practice. Like we we have a a steady drumbeat of situations across the country where SWAT teams go bursting into homes and people end up getting shot and killed and they had nothing to do with the crime that was at the root of the investigation. The the officers got the wrong house or, uh, you know, they got bad information. And one of the things that struck me about this story is the picture of the SWAT officer with the baby, this three month old child and holy cow, this could have gone wrong in so many ways. And that's why I I think we ought to have a much higher standard 
before you send a SWAT team into any home, uh, regardless of the quality of the information. But but I think that um, fortunately for this family, it doesn't seem that there were any physical injuries um, other than the damage to their house. But but man, it is just it it terrifies me to see SWAT raids being used in this manner because of uh, the consequences can be so much more dire than we're seeing in this particular case. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of that horrible case in Louisville, uh, Brianna Taylor, I yep. believe her yeah. name was. And and looking at this case here, I appreciate that police should take carjacking seriously. That's also a terrifying crime. A lot of people are like, oh, it's just stolen AirPods. Well, it's not stolen AirPods. It's AirPods that were in a car that was carjacked. But when you're talking about a search warrant to go in and look through the house to find the AirPods, that to me is so different than officers being able to come in with a battering ram, like in the case of of Breonna Taylor, somebody ends up dead. Nicole, do prosecutors treat that differently? Do judges treat that differently in your experience? Well, so again, I'm not justifying what happened here. And I and I agree with Dave 100 percent about the seriousness of this issue. And I think that SWAT teams being used for these kinds of things are uh, it's an increasing phenomenon. And that that really is an issue that needs to be looked at. But I but on the flip side, I do think there may have been some sort of issue that there were some and I could be wrong about this, but I think I remember reading that there were guns in the car. And so they thought that there were guns in the home. Mm-hmm. And that is probably going to be at least their justification for going in in a SWAT team type manner. Um, you know, like I said, just because the, uh, and I'm going to say this wrong again, the AirPods <laughs> Good job, were, <laughs> uh, you know, potentially in the home. I don't that's why I want to read the search warrant. I don't know that there's justification then for them to say in the search warrant, that means there's probable cause that there are all these firearms in the home. Mm-hmm. So I think that is a big issue with why they went in the way that they did and whether or not that was justified remains to be seen. So- and I'm going back to the days when Nora and I were prosecutors together. It's been my experience that the police always use a battering ram when they're executing a search warrant. And it is never the way it is on TV where two police officers come up, ring the doorbell, say, we have a a search warrant here. The homeowner looks at it, gets on the phone, calls his lawyer. It's never that way. That's not how it goes. No. They always go in, guns blazing, and rightly or wrongly, in this case, definitely wrongly, but they always are assuming the worst. I can understand, you know, officers have to protect themselves. They do have to assume the worst. But boy, to me, the battering ram feels like overkill. You know, and these police officers, again, they do have this broad sort of qualified immunity where then you can't hold them accountable, even if, as in this case, they don't later fix the door. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's the other element to this is, is one of the things that, I personally have been hoping for the courts to take more seriously is in one of these circumstances where it's abundantly clear that the police had the wrong house and they do all this damage, you'd at least, you'd at least like to think that they would pay for the damage to be repaired. You'd think. Um, you'd like to think that. But, but there have been a number of cases in recent years where the cops came in, caused damage, and then they refused to pay for the repairs, and the courts would not hold them to it. Like, the courts did not require them to compensate the property owners who had homes destroyed in some circumstances. Um, I, I think that that's a horrible place for the law to be, but that is where we are right now. And unless we see courts kind of changing their tack on this, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that this family is going to prevail on that particular kind of a claim. I'd like to say differently, but I'm not sure that they will. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, one of the images that stuck in my mind from uh, this situation, uh, it it wasn't an actual image, but it was one that I can imagine, is one of the officers literally punched a hole in the drywall. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not only terrifying, but obviously causes damage, and it's just, you know, it's sort of emblematic of... um, you know, how they went in there with guns blazing. Yeah. We should note that uh, our friend Beavis Shock, who is sometimes a panelist on this show, that he is the attorney pursuing this case. So uh, we're going to keep an eye on this one. I have a feeling we'll probably be talking about this one again, maybe when it gets booted out of court because of qualified immunity. We'll, we'll be back. And uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that if Mr. Shatak is on the other side, 
the state's going to lose on this one. Oh, hey, okay. So, well, there's a prediction yeah, for, for yeah, Bevis. He's a very, yeah. very competent um, attorney, and I would sure hate to have him on the other side. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's another one I want to make sure we talk about today. A very odd case. A beloved Cherokee Street Parade has received a cease and desist. The People's Joy Parade was formed by some local artists as part of the Cinco de Mayo festivities on that street. Well, last year, some of the artists who'd been involved formed a limited liability company. And now when the Cinco de Mayo organizers said they're going forward with the parade this year... The lawyer for the artists and their LLC sent them a cease and desist letter, basically saying, you can't go on with this parade. We own this parade now. So I have a lot of questions here. I guess the big one I'm wondering about, how do you figure out who owns a parade? We know this parade had a lot of people who kind of came together to get it started. Can someone sort of seize the trademark, hire a lawyer, and, and cease and desist the others? Trademarks are usually governed by who wins the race to either the Secretary of State's office for their state rights or the Patent and Trademark Office for the federal rights. So whoever got there first, that's who the trademark belongs to, and they have the right. And in fact, if they don't stand up and exercise those rights, that could compromise their ability to use the trademark as a defense or as a tool for prosecution going forward. So we do believe these these artists, they formed first. You know, they got this LLC. They went out and got this trademark. So now if they try to throw this parade, this, this other group tries to throw this parade that they've been throwing, they could be in some trouble. What if they threw a parade but just didn't use the same name? They have to change the name. Oh, okay. They, they have to, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, unless they want some serious legal liability, there's no way that that parade goes forward with the existing name. So the artists can't stop any parade. They could just stop People's Joy Parade named parade. Right. It's the name of it. It's the name that's the trademark. And so, you, I mean, literally, I wrote my notes here. Can't stop parade, can stop name use. <laughs> So can anybody who say that I'm a part of a group of volunteers, we're all working on something together. Can I just go out and like get a trademark for that? And then it's my trademark. Do trademark offices investigate whether I actually have the right to said trademark? Well, that's kind of sort of what happened with the new Homer G. Phillips Hospital, because that group was which was a alumni association of people who worked at Homer G. Phillips. They incorporated, got a trademark or whatever, and their argument, unsuccessful, but their argument was, we now have the right to control this name, and even though we're the um, Homer G. Phillips Alumni Association, you cannot use Homer G. Phillips in your name. So you cannot open a new hospital under the Homer G. Phillips name, but somebody won the right to do that. That's right. Some yeah. random white guy came in, took their name, and started a hospital. They were not successful in stopping that. They were not. Yeah, so it may be that what the uh, parade organizers need to do is is find a new name. Um, you know, they they are going to be free to have the parade as long as they get the appropriate permits to do so. Um, but yeah, they'll they'll have to do it under a different name, alas. I really kind of love that name, People's Joy Parade. And I do understand the people who got the trademark for it. They intend to keep that going on, just probably in a different location. So, um, you know, there's still hope. We, we could still have a People's Joy Parade this year. We'll see where it happens. I want to talk quickly about the Missouri Supreme Court ruled against a death row inmate uh, last week, or maybe two weeks ago. Brian Dorsey is scheduled to be executed in April. His attorneys had filed a habeas corpus petition asking for the court to intervene. Now, that appeal rested on two arguments. Arguments. One involved the idea he couldn't be guilty of premeditated murder because he was suffering from drug-induced psychosis when he committed this double homicide. Nicole, I found that kind of a compelling argument. If I'm not in my right mind, how do I plot a murder? Are you surprised that argument failed? Well, so there is a specific Missouri statute on this issue. It's If anyone's curious and wants to look up you know, mundane statutes, it's 562.076. But it's literally about, uh, sets out the ramifications or the, the uh, borders for voluntary intoxication defense. And so evidence that a person was voluntarily intoxicated or drugged may be admissible when it's otherwise relevant on issues of conduct, but it can't be admissible to just say, well, you're not guilty because you went out and got yourself drunk 
right? Mm-hmm. And and purposely made yourself drugged or drunk, and so you're not guilty of the offense. So what's interesting about this case is it was a first-degree murder case, which first-degree murder requires deliberation, which means your ability to um, think about whether this is the right or wrong activity to do and then go and do it, right? So um, what happened at trial was this guy did not bring up voluntary intoxication as a way to negate uh, the deliberation element. He never brought it up his trial. He never brought it up, you know, at any point until this habeas petition. And so the court basically said, sorry, it's too late. It's too late. The, the point to have brought this up was at your trial. So it's not that it's an impossible thing to um, negate your mental culpability. It's just that you can't do it in the way that he did it. Well, so this comes up as the second part of his argument, trying to stop his own execution. His lawyers are saying, hey, these past lawyers were ineffective. They were paid a flat fee. They had every incentive just to hustle this this thing along. The court also didn't give that any uh, Well, because credence. there would have been past opportunities to have brought that up in an ineffective assistance of counsel claim, and it didn't come up. And so the appellate court is basically saying, okay, you had, you know, X many opportunities to have brought this up. You never did. So a habeas petition is not going to be the appropriate place. Just to clarify, he actually um, did raise the ineffective assistance of counsel argument, and it was rejected previously Mm. by another court. And so one of the things that um, Judge Powell said is that this other court found that the funds independent of counsel's uh, flat fee were available as needed and that their actions were based on reasonable trial strategy and not finances. So that... That conclusion by the other court really did slam the door for trying to revive that claim at the Missouri Supreme Court. So it does appear Missouri will be going through with another execution um, later this month. I will say, uh, right before we came on on air today, uh, his lawyers did file a clemency petition saying to Governor Parson, this is a well-loved person who's had an exemplary record for 17 years. He has shown that he's gotten his life together. Give him some mercy. Rock's a rock. Rock to rock. I don't see that flying in place. Yeah, I mean, it is one of the most gruesome murders. It's a bad that, murder. Yeah, I'm not even going to describe it on the air, but it is a pretty gruesome yeah. murder. I, and, it would be yeah. surprising to me if, if Governor Parsons stepped in. Dave, in our last minute here, uh, you had a lawsuit against the town of Edgar Springs. They banned your client from City Hall. The judge said they couldn't do that. They lost, were ordered to pay $80,000 in legal fees, which I know it would be huge for your nonprofit law firm here. Uh, they plan to appeal they're not going to appeal. Well, they they did appeal, and uh, they got to the point in the case where they had to produce the record to the Court of Appeals, and at that point they said, you know what, we're out. And and so they dismissed their appeal. So that case is now done. The question is going to be whether and how much of that award we ever see. Um, I've, I've been in contact with their uh, city attorney a couple of times uh, about this, and He's not responding to my emails. <laughs> and so um, I I know that they managed to pay their attorney for the last four or five years, uh, several tens of thousands of dollars. So I would like to think that maybe they'll figure out a way to uh, pay the judgment against them. But eh, we're, we'll have to find out. Eric, I got to ask you this, because every time you and I talk about one of these cases, you have some advice. What would you do if you were Dave here and they offered to pay, say, half of his legal fee? Oh, I would probably execute a replevin and take the city hall, as <laughs> it was attempted in in East St. Louis, what, 20 years ago. It was back when Eric Vickers was the city attorney. And um, someone got a judgment against the city and proceeded to execute against city hall. Now, that encouraged compliance with the court order real quickly. When oh, your hey. city hall was at risk, so this is some great advice. There you you know, know what? Dave. This is uh, Eric Eric Banks of Banks Law LLC. Thank you for closing the show with some good legal advice there. My pleasure. And Dave Rowland, I hope you're going to take that advice. Litigation Director of the Missouri Freedom Center, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. And Nicole Gorofsky of Jenkins and Kling, thank you so much. Thank you. This episode was produced by Sarah Vensky. 
Our audio engineer is Aaron Doerr. This podcast was mixed and edited by Aaron. Production assistance from Roche Hemmings. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.